So do you think that our bodies are like a large ear when we're listening to music? I mean, does music, can it get into your pores like it does into your ears? I'm just very fascinated by this. Like, do our bones, they take, you know, different parts of our body, like bones? They do. Every object, be it a bone in your body, be it the earth, has a natural set of frequencies at which it wants to vibrate by virtue of how it's constructed, how it's put together, what it's made of. Every object has the capacity to vibrate in some manner. You know, amazingly, we can write down equations for how things will vibrate if they're hit or plucked or if air is forced by strings. But there's no music in the equations. Somehow those equations have to be animated. Somewhere in there, this gray thing inside of our head plays a role. The brain. For most of us, the vibrations of sound waves are relayed to the brain through the ear, which converts them to neural signals. As the sound hits the eardrum and it wiggles in and out, it sets up pressure waves inside a snail-like structure called the cochlea. The cochlea has hair cells lining it that are tuned to specific frequencies. So at one end, the hair cells only fire an electrical charge in response to low frequencies. At the other end, they fire an electrical charge in response to high frequencies, and of course, everything in between. So the signal goes from the ear to the brain stem and up into the brain. And that electrical charge goes to the auditory cortex which is amazingly laid out in pitch order, almost like a piano keyboard. The hair cells are wired to the auditory cortex in such a way that you've got low notes stimulating this part of the auditory cortex on up to high notes stimulating this part. We used to think that there was a music center in the brain. We don't think that anymore. There are music centers and they're spread all over the brain. The auditory cortex activates as it receives signals from the brainstem through the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate nucleus. If you could look at all the different areas of the brain involved in extracting the signal from sound to turn it into music, you'd see a bunch of coordinated and a bunch of uncoordinated firing in different parts of the brain, kind of like a neural symphony, a neural orchestra. So pitch is processed in one set of neural regions, tempo in another, loudness in another, timbre, whether it's a violin or a trumpet or a human voice in yet another, and it all comes together later. The later in this case is maybe 30 thousandths of a second, so rapidly that you never knew the things were ever apart. <laughs> When we hear Bobby McFerrin singing, we just hear those musical sounds. You know, when, when someone says that piece of music touched me or moved me, it's very literal. The sound of my voice is entering your ear canal and it's moving your eardrum. That's a very intimate act. It's very, I'm very literally touching you. And when you speak to me, you are literally touching me. And when we extend that principle to the sound of a violin, you know, it's not so much the sound of the violin, it's the silence thereafter. That's the moment when, in some ways, you hear what was just said. Sound is a very strange phenomenon. What is it? It doesn't live in our world. What we played or heard uh, 10 seconds ago is in this room is gone. And this, I think, is what gives music its really tragic element of the fact that it can die, of the fact that it is a lifetime. Every note is a lifetime for itself. And there is an element of penetration 
through the ear, which uh, gives sound, and in the end, of course, music, with the great power that it can have. In hospitals, music's connection to the body is used to steady the breathing of premature babies and the heart rates of cardiac patients. Music often echoes the rhythm of the human heartbeat. And our physical connection with music is confirmed by studies showing the body is a barometer of our emotional response. <laughs> 